In this video, we're going to take a look at the notion of arc length and how to calculate it using an integral. The idea of arc length is quite simple. Suppose you take a nice, smooth graph of a function over an interval, say from A to B, and you imagine that the graph's made of wire, and you slowly straighten this wire out and then proceed to measure it. The resulting length we will call the arc length of the curve. So in this case, say, the arc length is about 11.75 units. So what we'll do next is we're going to invite calculus to the party. We're going, to, we're going to approximate arc length using a sum of segment lengths, which are easy to calculate. We're going to recognize the resulting approximation as a Riemann sum, and then we're going to identify the definite integral that arises from the limiting value of those Riemann sums. So we'll take the interval from A to B, and we'll chop it up into several pieces. And in fact, we will relabel the endpoints so that they're consistent with re this relabeling. We'll go ahead and evaluate the function at each of these endpoints, and then we're going to draw these segments here that join those endpoints. And if we could calculate the lengths of each of those segments, then the length of the curve is approximately the sum of these segment lengths. Let's concentrate on one sub-interval and we'll sort of generalize once and for all the process. So let's say the endpoints of this sub-interval are called x sub k and x sub k plus 1. Now we're looking to calculate delta L, the change in length here, this, this little bit of segment that joins the endpoints. And how do we calculate this? Well, actually it's Pretty easy if we could measure delta x, the separation between these two arguments, and delta y, the amount that the, the uh, value of the function changes over that interval, the Pythagorean theorem would tell us that delta l squared is equal to delta x squared plus delta y squared. Let's apply the mean value theorem to come up with a slick alternate expression for delta l squared. We will notice that if we assume the function's differentiable on the inside of the interval, there should be a location, let's call it x sub k star, at this argument, the value of the derivative, that is the tangent slope at that point, is going to be equal to the average rate of change of the function on the subinterval. In other words, delta y over delta x. So the mean value theorem guarantees the existence of an xk star such that f prime of xk star is equal to delta y over delta x. Now if we solve for delta y, we get this expression here which we could then substitute back into our original expression from the Pythagorean formula. Now there's a common delta x squared, which we can factor out. And now we can take the square root of both sides. And here is an expression for delta L. The next step is to apply this expression on each of the subintervals. So we're going to notice that we can find these arguments on the subintervals where the derivative evaluated at those arguments matches the secant slope. The arc length would be approximately equal to the sum of these segment lengths. Let's clean this up and use sigma notation to make this much more compact. Now the next observation is we could chop up the interval into more and more pieces. And the more subdivisions we have, presumably, the better the approximation. And obviously, at some point, you're going to get a pretty good approximation. And the bigger observation now is that we are looking at a Riemann sum. In fact, we're really heading towards a limiting value of Riemann sum. So if we can identify what it is we're finding the Riemann sum for, then we can generate an integral. So in fact, the arc length we're looking for is the limiting value as the number of subdivisions goes to infinity of this expression here. The integrand function that we should put inside of our interval is the square root of 1 plus f prime of x squared. This definite integral yields the arc length. Please note we're not finding area under the curve. This is not going to give a signed area. And you can certainly see that since it's the square root of some function. There's no way to get negative values, for instance. This is not giving a signed area. This is giving us the length of the graph on the interval from A to B.
So let's test drive this. What we're going to do is we're going to look at three examples. The first example is quite simple. Let's look at a linear function that has a formula mx plus k where m and k are constants. We want to find the length of this curve over the interval from a to b. Please note this is a linear function and the slope is m. Now our first attempt is going to be via calculus. We're going to give our integral a test drive. So the function is mx plus k, which means the derivative is simply the constant function m. And that means our arc length integrand should be the square root of 1 plus m squared. Please note that this expression is a constant function of x, so the integration is going to be quite easy. The integral from a to b of this integrand function is simply square root of 1 plus m squared times the width of the interval b minus a. That should give us the arc length in question. So now we're going to redo this problem using geometry and we better arrive at the same location. So this separation of arguments is simply b minus a and of course that change in value of the function is going to be the slope times the change in x. In other words m times b minus a. The Pythagorean theorem tells us then that the length squared we're looking for is b minus a squared plus m squared times b minus a squared we can factor the b minus a squared to one side and when we take the square root we will notice that we arrive at the same answer. In fact, the arc length is square root of 1 plus m squared times b minus a. So you'll notice that the arc length integral gives us the same result as something we already knew how to calculate using pure geometry. So far so good. Let's look at a more complicated example. How about the quadratic function x squared? Let's find the arc length of this on the interval from 0 to 1. In this case, the formula for the function being x squared means the formula for the derivative is 2x, and that means the arc length integrand is the square root of 1 plus 4x squared. So we need to evaluate this integral from 0 to 1. Now it turns out it's possible to do this exactly, but we're not going to go into that. It suffices for this example to note that the integral is approximately 1.478943. This approximation is going to be good enough for the next few observations. So consider the straight line from 0, 0 to 1, 1. Its length is square root of 2, and we notice that the square root of 2 is approximately 1.41, and this is a shorter root from 0, 0 to 1, 1. We expect that number to be smaller than the arc length integral we just calculated. And in fact, that's the case. Now we could also take a rather circular route. In fact, let's build a circle with radius 1 centered at 0, 1, and this path is a quarter circle. The whole circle would have circumference 2 pi, and so this quarter circle has length pi over 2. And we'll notice that pi over 2 is about 1.57, and of course, this is longer than the route we took along the squaring function and we would expect this number to be bigger and in fact it is. So it seems plausible that our integral for arc length has given us a number that's correct. Now for our final example we're going to be looking at something that's rather sophisticated in terms of the integration involved. So we're going to take the function square root of r squared minus x squared where r is some positive constant and we're going to find this arc length on the interval from 0 to r. Now, of course, the graph here is just a quarter circle. So in fact, we know before we even start this process that the arc length should be pi r over 2. Now, the integrand in this case for our arc length integral is found by first taking the derivative, which simplifies to negative x over the square root of r squared minus x squared. Then we're going to look at the expression 1 plus the square of the derivative and notice that that simplifies to r squared over r squared minus x squared and now we can take the square root of that and we obtain this integrand for our arc length integral. We need to evaluate the integral of this from 0 to r. Now word of warning is in order. What we're about to do is trig substitution. So if you're not familiar with trig substitution you can either just in the video now or perhaps uh, use it as an introduction to trig substitution. So here we go. We're going to build 
a right triangle that's going to be quite helpful to us in evaluating this integral. What we want to do is we want to construct sides so that the square root of r squared minus x squared shows up in the triangle. So by choosing the base to be x and the hypotenuse to be r, then the Pythagorean formula guarantees that this missing side will be the square root of r squared minus x squared. This triangle is going to serve as our inspiration for choosing a new variable, which we'll call theta, and we'll choose it to be this angle right here, and then we'll find the slickest way to relate theta to x. In fact, the ratio x to r is just cosine of theta, so that's what we'll use. We'll use the relationship x equals r cosine theta as our so-called trig substitution. We're going to use this new variable theta, and hopefully when we convert the integral that currently is in terms of x and turn it into an integral involving this new variable theta, we'll get something that's easy to evaluate. So if x is r cosine theta, then the differential dx is negative r sine theta d theta. We'll notice that the ratio of the square root of r squared minus x squared over r is almost exactly what we want. That's sine theta, and if we reciprocate both sides, then we get exactly the integral we want expressed as 1 over sine theta. So this integrand we can substitute in. Now the limits of integration, if x goes from 0 to r, we want to figure out what theta should run from. Now this is the relationship, x is equal to r cosine theta. We want to be a little careful about this, and we'll notice that if we look at the relevant part of the graph, as x goes from 0 to r, we're trying to figure out what theta does. So we'll notice that x going from 0 to r coincides with theta running from pi over 2 to 0. You can sort of see this graphically as you watch a point on the graph move from one side to the other, that our new integral should run from theta equals pi over 2 to theta equals 0. So there's our transformation of limits of integration. Now we're going to put all these pieces together. We're going to swap out the x dependence for theta dependence. So the integrand becomes 1 over sine theta. The differential becomes negative r sine theta d theta. And the limits of integration become pi over 2 to 0. Now a couple of things uh, we can do here to simplify matters. We can, first of all, cancel the sine thetas. And we can also swap the limits of integration at the expense of putting in an, a negative 1, which will cancel that negative sign. So this really simplifies quite nicely. The integral now is r times integral from theta to pi over 2 of d theta, which is easy. It's pi r over 2, which is, of course, exactly what we knew it had to be. And so the arc length integral seems to be working in this case as well.